This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 3 for April 10 to 16, ready for teaching on April 17, All Future Generations, and read today by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word again today, as we this week study what your word has to say to us, as we come to you to find what you want for each of us through this amazing system of covenants that uh, you had with your people and you still have, we pray that we may be able to not only understand, but to accept that the final one is the one that applies to us and that we have a place in your kingdom as a result. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6 verse 8. Let's read Genesis 6 verse 8 again. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Bacteria are plant organisms too small to see without a microscope. Even after being magnified 1,000 times, a single common round bacterium appears no larger than a pencil point. Given favourable conditions for growth, sufficient warmth, moisture and food, bacteria multiply at an extremely rapid rate. For example, some bacteria reproduce by simple fission, a mature cell simply splits into two daughter cells. When fission takes place every hour, one bacterium can produce more than 16 million new bacteria in 24 hours. At the end of 48 hours, hundreds of billions of bacteria will have appeared. This microscopic phenomenon in the natural world illustrates the rapid growth of evil after the fall. Gifted with giant intellects, robust health and longevity, this virile race forsook God and prostituted their rare powers to the pursuit of iniquity in all forms. While bacteria may be exterminated by sunlight, chemicals or high temperatures, God chose to check this rampant rebellion by a universal flood. And here is the week at a glance. What? did sin do to God's creation? What were some of the characteristics of Noah? What elements were involved in the covenant with Noah? In what ways is God's grace revealed in the covenant with Noah before the flood? What does the covenant God made with humanity after the flood teach us about his universal love for us? Sunday, April 11, The Sin Principle Our text for today is Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The divine opinion at the end of God's creation was that all was very good, Genesis 1.31. Then sin entered and the paradigm shifted. Things weren't very good any more. God's orderly creation was marred by sin and all of its loathsome results. Rebellion had reached terrible proportions by Noah's day. Evil consumed the race. Though the Bible does not give us many details, the transgressions and rebellion were clearly something that even a loving, patient and forgiving God couldn't tolerate. There's more in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 90 to 92, if you want to read that as well. How could things get so bad so quickly? The answer is, perhaps, not that hard to find. How many people today, looking at their own sins, have not asked the same thing? How did things get so bad so quickly? Question, look up the texts listed below, write down the points they make, Notice the steady progression of sin. 
First of all, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then verses 11 to 13. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And then Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and killed him. And verse 19, Then Lamech took for himself two wives, the name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And verse 23, Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. And Genesis 6, verse 2, That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And finally, verse 11 of chapter 6, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Genesis 6, verse 5 and 11 did not arise in a vacuum. There was a history before them. Their terrible result had a cause. Sin progressively got worse. It tends to do that. Sin is not just a cut or a wound with some automatic built-in process that brings healing. On the contrary, if left unchecked, sin multiplies, never satisfied until it leads to ruin and death. One does not have to imagine life before the flood to see this principle operating. It exists all around us, even now. No wonder God hates sin. No wonder, sooner or later, sin will be eradicated. A just, loving God could do nothing else with it. The good news, of course, is that though He wants to get rid of sin, He wants to save sinners. That's what the covenant is all about. Monday, April 12, The Man Noah Our text for today is Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Amid all the texts about the evil of the antediluvian, that's the pre-flood world, the man Noah stands out in contrast to those around him. Look at the above text and the three particular points that the Bible makes about Noah. To the best of your ability, write down what you think each of these points mean. 1. He was a righteous man. 2. He was blameless. 3. He walked with God. There is no question, Noah was someone who had a saving relationship with the Lord. He was someone whom God could work with, someone who would listen to him, obey him, and trust in him. That is why the Lord was able to use Noah to fulfill his purposes, and why Peter, in the New Testament, called him a preacher of righteousness, in Second Peter 2, verse 5. Question, read Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. How does this text help us understand the relationship between Noah and the Lord? 
Genesis 6, verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The word grace occurs here for the first time in Scripture, and clearly has the same meaning as in the New Testament references, where the merciful, unmerited favour of God, exercised toward undeserving sinners, is described. Thus, we need to understand that, however blameless and righteous Noah was, he was still a sinner who needed the unmerited favour of his God. In that sense, Noah is no different from any of us who seek earnestly to follow the Lord. And so to finish today, understanding that Noah needed God's grace, as do the rest of us, look at your own life and ask yourself this question. Could it be said of me that I am, like Noah, righteous, blameless, and that I walk with God? Write down your reasons for whatever position you take, and, if you feel comfortable, share it with the class on Sabbath. Tuesday, April 13, Covenant with Noah. Our text for today is Genesis 6, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. In this one verse, we have the basics of the biblical covenant that God makes with humanity. God and humankind enter into an agreement. Very simple. Yet, there are more elements than first meet the eye. To begin, there is the element of obedience on humanity's part. God says to Noah that he and his family shall go into the ark. They have their part to do, and if they do not do it, the covenant is broken. If the covenant is broken, they are the ultimate losers. For in the end, they are the beneficiaries of the covenant. After all, if Noah said no to God and did not want to abide by the covenant or said yes but then changed his mind, what would have been the results for him and his family? Question. God says that it is my covenant. What does that tell us about the basic nature of the covenant? What difference would there be in our concept of the covenant if the Lord had called it our covenant. However unique this particular situation, we see here the basic God-human dynamic found in the covenant. By establishing my covenant with Noah, God here again displays his grace. He shows that he is willing to take the initiative in order to save human beings from the results of their sins. In short, this covenant must not be seen as some sort of union of equals in which each partner in the covenant is dependent upon the other, we could say that God benefits from the covenant, but only in a radically different sense from the way humans do. He benefits in that those whom he loves will be given eternal life, no small satisfaction to the Lord, as we read in Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. But that is not to say that he benefits in the same way we, on the receiving end of the same covenant, benefit. Try this analogy. A man has fallen overboard from a boat in the midst of a storm. Someone on the deck says that he will throw a life preserver over to haul him in. The one in the water, however, has to agree to his end of the deal, and that is to grab on and to hold on to what has been provided him. That, in many ways, is what the covenant between God and humanity is all about. And so to finish the day, how does the analogy above help you to understand the concept of grace that exists in the covenant? How does it help you understand what your relationship to God, even now, needs to be based on?
Wednesday, April 14, Sign of the Rainbow Genesis 9, verses 12 and 13 reads, And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Few natural phenomena are more beautiful than the rainbow. Who does not remember as a child one's first fascination and wonder as those amazing bars of light bent across the sky like some sort of beckoning mystical portal into the heavens? Even as adults our breath can be taken away by the sight of those outrageous colours in the clouds. No wonder that even today the rainbow is used as a symbol for so many things, from political organisations to cults to rock bands to travel agencies. Look up the word rainbow in the internet and see. Obviously, those beautiful bands of colour still touch chords in our hearts and minds. Of course, that was God's whole point. Question. What did the Lord say the rainbow would symbolize? Genesis 9, verses 12 to 17. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I will make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh." The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The Lord said he would use the rainbow as a sign of my covenant in verse 15. How interesting that he would use the word covenant here, for in this case, the covenant differs from how it is used elsewhere. In contrast to the covenant with Abraham or the Sinai covenant, there is no specific obligation expressed on the part of those who would benefit from the covenant, even Noah. God's words here are to all people, to Every living creature of all flesh, it said in verse 15, for all future generations, in verse 12. God's words are universal, all-encompassing, regardless of whether anyone chooses to obey the Lord or not. In this sense, the concept of covenant here is not used as it is elsewhere in the Bible when talking about the relationship between God and humans. Question. In what sense does this covenant also reveal God's grace? Who initiated this covenant? Who is the ultimate benefactor? To finish the day, though the covenant, as expressed here, does not come with specific obligations on our part, God's part, of course, is never to destroy the world with a flood. How could our knowledge of what the rainbow symbolises influence us to live in obedience to the Lord? In short, are there some implied obligations on our part when we look up into the sky and see the rainbow? Think of the whole context in which the rainbow came and the lessons we can learn from that account. Thursday, April 15, only Noah was left. Our text for today is Genesis chapter 7 and verse 23. He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. In this text, 
one finds the first mention of the concept of the remnant in the scriptures. The word translated as was left comes from another word whose root forms are used many times in the Old Testament where the idea of a remnant is conveyed. Genesis 45 verse 7 And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. And Isaiah 4, verse 3, And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, every one who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. And Isaiah 11, verse 11, In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant which is left of his people. In all these cases, the italicized words, that's a remnant, who is left, and remnant which is left, are linked to the similar words was left found in Genesis chapter 7 verse 23. Question. Look at Genesis 7.23 and the other examples. How do you understand the concept of a remnant here? What are the surrounding conditions that led to a remnant? How does the covenant fit in with the idea of a remnant. Genesis 7, 23. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And as we read before in uh, Genesis 45 verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. And Isaiah 4 verse 3, And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, every one who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem. And Isaiah 11 verse 11, In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant which is left of his people. At the time of the flood, the creator of the world became the judge of the world. The nearing worldwide judgment raised the question whether all life on earth, even human life, would be destroyed. If not, who would be the survivors? Who would be the remnant? In this case, it was Noah and his family. Yet Noah's salvation was linked to God's covenant with him. Genesis 6 verse 18, which reads, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives, with you, a covenant that originated and was executed by a God of mercy and grace. They survived only because of what God did for them, however important their cooperation was. Whatever Noah's covenant obligations were, and no matter how faithfully he executed them, his only hope was in God's mercy. And so to finish today, Based upon our understanding of last day events, which includes a time when God will have a remnant, as we read in Revelation 12.17, what parallels can we learn from the story of Noah that will help us prepare to be part of the remnant? Revelation 12.17 reads, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In what ways are we making decisions every day that could impact just where we finally stand at that time? Friday, April 16. From the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 261, we read, The rainbow, a natural physical phenomenon, was a fitting symbol of God's promise never to destroy the earth again by a flood. 
Inasmuch as the climatic conditions of the earth would be completely different after the flood, and rains would in most parts of the world take the place of the form of beneficent dew to moisten the soil, something was needed to quiet men's fears each time rain began to fall. The spiritual mind can see in natural phenomena God's revelations of himself, as we read in Romans one twenty. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Thus the rainbow is evidence to the believer that the rain will bring blessing and not universal destruction. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. The first starts with a quote from the story of the flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh, translated by N. K. Sanders, the Penguin Group, published in 1972, and from page 108. In those days, the world teemed, the people multiplied, the world bellowed like a wild bull, and the great god was aroused by the clamour. Enlil heard the clamour, and he said to the gods in council, The uproar of mankind is intolerable, and sleep is no longer possible by reason of the Babel. So the gods agreed to exterminate man. Compare this reason for the flood to the reason given in the Bible. 2. Noah did more than warn his generation of God's approaching judgment. The purpose of his warning was to help the people sense their need of salvation. Why are truths of salvation generally unpopular? List and discuss some things that hinder many persons from accepting God's plan for their salvation. For instance, see John 3 and verse 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And John seven forty-seven and 48, then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? And John 12, verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And James 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so to summarise this week's lesson. In this week's study, we have noted that the covenants God made with Noah are the first to be discussed explicitly in the Bible. They display his gracious interest in the human family and his desire to enter into a saving relationship with them. God reaffirmed his covenant with Noah, and it was Noah's commitment to God that shielded him from the prevailing apostasy and eventually saved him and his family from the devastating judgment of the flood. And from the book The Story of Redemption, page 71, written by Ellen G. White, we read, This symbol, the rainbow, in the clouds, is to confirm the belief of all and establish their confidence in God, for it is a token of divine mercy and goodness to man, that, although God has been provoked to destroy the earth by the flood, yet his mercy still encompasseth the earth. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Made for Mission in Mexico. It's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Gustavo Terracina is not a pastor, but he has a passion for planting churches. Gustavo, a 58-year-old retired customer service representative for a Mexican telecommunications company, praised God when his second church plant, located in La Uesteca, 
a small community on the outskirts of Villa Hermosa, Mexico, became a full-fledged church in ten years. But he wasn't sure what to do next. He and his wife Maria Hernandez prayed, What do you want us to do this coming year? she prayed. After praying for a few weeks, Gustavo learned from the district pastor about hopes to plant a church in Playa del Rosario, another small community outside the city. He prayed for three weeks and agreed to lead the project. But where were they to meet? That problem was solved when a church member offered his house for the Sabbath meetings. He didn't live there, so Gustavo could use the house freely. It wouldn't cost a peso. On the first Sabbath, two mothers and twelve children joined Gustavo and his wife for worship. Seeing so many people at the first meeting, he felt that God was blessing the project and he could move forward. He organised a week-long evangelistic series in the house church and the number of children increased to twenty. With so many children, Gustavo decided to conduct a special Sabbath school for children on Sabbath mornings and a worship service for both children and adults in the afternoons. Trouble struck one of the mothers who attended every Sabbath. The owner of the house she rented threatened to evict her and her five children. If you keep going to those meetings, you will have to leave, the owner said. The mother kept going to the meetings and she was evicted. But she was not discouraged. She found a new house to rent and continued worshipping. At the house church, worshippers prayed and intermittently fasted for the mother's former house owner. During a literature distribution drive, the owner accepted an Adventist magazine and asked for prayer. A few weeks later, she accepted a loaf of sweetbread from a church member and asked for more prayers. Gustavo, meanwhile, organised a second set of evangelistic meetings, this time in an Adventist church located half a mile, just under one kilometre away in a neighbouring community. A woman and a boy were baptised at the meetings, becoming the first fruits of his church plant. The house church had its first two members for just four months after opening. By faith, we know God will add more members and our small group will grow into a full-fledged church, he said. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that helped expand the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Southeast Hospital in Villa Hermosa, Mexico. And there's a lovely photograph here of Gustavo with his beautiful smile. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.